Hello, my name is Henry Rooney and I am a SQL Server Consultant working for Wardy IT Solutions. During this session I am going to discuss Always On, which is a new feature in SQL Server 2012. Over the past few months this has probably been one of the most talked about inclusions in the upcoming SQL Server release. So what is Always On? Well, in simple terms, it takes advantage of two of the best high availability features for SQL Server, namely clustering and database mirroring. Each of these technologies had their own pros and cons and had to be implemented with consideration for the specific purpose that they were required for. With the advent of Always On and the new capabilities that have been included with it, a highly robust and flexible HA and DR solution can be implemented. For this session I'm assuming that there is familiarity with the features that are available on clustering and database mirroring. What I want to do is cover the configuration of Always On. So let's get started. What do we need for Always On? At a minimum we need two servers that are participating in a Microsoft Windows cluster. On each of these servers, or as I will refer to them from now on, nodes, there is a standalone instance of SQL Server. Because they are standalone SQL instances, there is no requirement for shared storage on the cluster. Let me be more specific about this, because I have encountered confusion when I cover this area of Always On. When SQL Server is installed on a cluster, the instance can migrate between the nodes in the cluster. This gives you your high availability but for always on the instances are not installed as cluster resources. Let me show you what I mean on a cluster that I am running. I have created a test environment on my Hyper-V server. The name of the cluster I have created is very imaginative. It's called Cluster. As we can see, the only clustered resources currently available are the cluster name, IP address, and the file share. If I go to the storage section of Failover Cluster Manager, you will notice that there is no shared storage available. I chose to build my cluster on Windows 2008 or 2 Server Core. So all my administrative actions are being performed from another server on the domain. If you are interested in SQL Server 2012 running on Server Core, Wardy IT Solutions have produced a white paper and the link for this document will be available at the end of the presentation. To begin configuring Always On we must enable the feature as this is not configured during the SQL Server installation process. The traditional way to do this is through Configuration Manager by selecting the properties of the SQL Server instance and selecting the Always On High Availability tab. Enabling this requires a restart of the SQL Server instance and must be performed on all instances that are participating in the Always On availability groups. Because I am running on Server Core, I do not have the ability to configure Always On through the GUI. So I've created a PowerShell script to enable Always On. When the update is applied, I will be prompted to restart each SQL instance. First Server Core Node 1, then Server Core Node 2. By performing this action through PowerShell, I have the ability to configure multiple instances from a central location. To confirm that Always On is enabled on each instance, I'm going to run the following query through Management Studio first on Server Core Node 1, then on Server Core Node 2. Now I'm going to configure two databases for Always On. For a database to qualify for Always On, it must be in the full recovery model. Once this has been completed, we create an availability group. An availability group is used to corral databases together. This ensures that interdependent databases always reside on the same SQL Server instance. So if one fails over, it takes the other databases with it. 
To create an availability group, we right click on Always On High Availability and select New Availability Group Wizard. The first step in configuring an availability group is to provide it a name. In this case, we're calling it Always On Demo. Next, we select the databases that we wish to participate in the availability group. If the database is not in the full recovery model, it will not be selectable at this point. Once the databases have been selected, we need to specify our replicas. Server Core Node 1 has been selected by default as this is the primary. We are going to add Server Core Node 2. For this purpose, I want automatic failover between Server Core Node 1 and Server Core Node 2. It's only possible to have one automatic failover pair, but there can be two synchronous secondaries, or a total of four secondaries participating in the availability group. For the purpose of this demonstration, I'm not going to discuss endpoints or backup preferences, but I am configuring a listener service. This entitles any applications connecting to the availability group to automatically be redirected to the secondary should the primary fail over. The next step in the process is to select the data synchronization. In this case I'm selecting full and I will specify a file share where a full backup of the databases will be placed and this will be distributed to the participating secondaries. After this has been completed a validation of all the settings is performed with a summary and the option of generating a script. The databases are now being backed up and restored on server core node 2. Once this is complete, the availability group has now been created. I have received a warning based on my cluster quorum configuration settings, but that is not something that I need to be concerned with for the testing purposes. If we go into Failover Cluster Manager, we'll see that there's a new resource group available with the same name as the listener service that we've set up with the IP address assigned to that listener service. If we go back into Management Studio, we will see that our availability group is now appearing. If we right click, select Show Dashboard, this shows us what servers are in the availability group and what databases, their synchronization status and the health of the entire availability group. Returning to Failover Cluster Manager, like any cluster resource, we can move this to Server Core Node 2. Just like a SQL Server failover, this takes the server name or the listener offline the IP address and then brings them back online on server core node 2. Now if we go back into Management Studio and refresh the databases we will see that they are synchronized and that server core node 2 is now the primary. The final demonstration illustrates an application automatically reconnecting to the database when the availability group fails over. If we look at the connection string for this application, it is connected to the listener service. I am now going to start the application, which inserts records into the database. I will now simulate a failover of the availability group to server core node 1. We can see that there is a connection failure while the availability group is failing over. Once the availability group comes online and the databases are accessible again, the application resumes its activity. To conclude what we have covered in this session, we have configured an always on for SQL Server, we have created availability group, we created a listener service on that availability group, and we failed the listener service between the nodes in the cluster. If there are any more questions, I can be contacted at my email address, henry.rooney at wardyit.com. And thank you for your time.